The painters in this series, classic or romantic, were the outstanding artists of their day. Successful, influential, part of the whole European movement, all but one, William Blake. All his life he was miserably poor and worked only for a few patrons or friends. Till recently he was hardly known outside England. His best work is on a small scale in a peculiar medium, a sort of colour etching. Compared to the great canvases of David or Delacroix, his prints must seem almost invisible. So why do I include him? Because in his best work there is a concentration of poetry and a prophetic power that makes him one of the key figures of the Romantic movement. Everybody who writes about Blake begins by saying that he was a visionary. It's a vague term. All artists, even the most realistic, start from some kind of vision. That's what leads them to select what they need from the infinite diversity of appearances. But with Blake, the word vision meant something more precise. He never drew from nature. He said it put him out. When asked by a friend to draw the ghost of a flea, he instantly said, I see him now before me. Quick, reach me my things. The flea then opened its mouth, and Blake made a detailed study of its lips and teeth. Later, he made a painting of the apparition. Where did these visions come from? Blake was very emphatic on this point. Vision, or imagination, is a representation of what eternally exists, really and unchangeably. Fable, or allegory, is formed by the daughters of memory. Imagination is surrounded by the daughters of inspiration. A graceful metaphor. But images must have some point of departure. And uh, the daughters of memory work on rather deeper level than was recognized in Blake's time. They even contributed to the vision of a flea, which seems to be compounded of a plate in a book called Micrographia and the devils of Michelangelo's Last Judgment. The fact is that Blake's visions did come from memory. From his childhood onwards, he had been a collector and an insatiable devourer of prints. And in 1784, on the death of his father, he set up as a print dealer. He continued to run the shop for three years, and an astonishing variety of material passed through his hands, including, as we can see from his work, such unexpected items as illustrated books on Eastern religions, books on Assyrian sculpture, and perhaps a few medieval manuscripts. Without doubt, the items that interest him most were prints after Michelangelo and the Antique, and that book of engravings after the Bolognese painter Tibaldi, which I mentioned when talking about Fusli. Blake's earliest original design is the engraving known as Glad Day, dated 1780. No doubt that this figure was extremely important to him. It was one of his longest held and most consistent visions. Blake had taken the design from a Renaissance diagram of a geometricized figure, what is known as Vitruvian Man, perhaps this woodcut in Scamozzi's architecture. Blake was never afraid of contradictions, but nothing could be more paradoxical that he should have found in this attempt to circumscribe man by reason, by the geometry that he detested, a symbol of liberated energy. But here a typical complication appears. Blake made a pencil drawing for Glad Day, and on the back did another of the same figure seen from behind. This backward view also became important to him and appears in one of his last great prints, Albion Adoring the Crucified Christ, which comes near the end of Jerusalem. Now, it is not at all characteristic of Blake, whose approach to form was graphic and not sculptural, to draw a back and front of the same figure. 
but the anomaly is explained by the fact that in a book called The Antiquities of Herculaneum, a book which was certainly known to Blake, is an engraving of the front and back of a Hellenistic bronze, and this bronze represents a Dionysiac figure dancing. So the title he gave to the first version of this idea, The Dance of Albion, is correct. Because Blake's visions often preceded his thoughts, he was not usually at his best in illustrating other people's work. But in 1787, Blake made the decision that was to release and transform his art. Instead of illustrating other people's writing, he would use his visions to decorate or illuminate his own poems. The first result was the Songs of Innocence and the Songs of Experience. The word illuminate suggests something very significant in Blake's character as an artist, his sympathy with the Middle Ages. He wrote, Greece and Rome, so far from being parents of arts and sciences, as they pretend, were destroyers of all art. Grecian is mathematical form, Gothic is living form. When he came to rework his very earliest engraving, which is a, a direct copy of a figure in Michelangelo's crucifixion of St. Peter, he inscribed it, this is one of the Gothic architects who built the great cathedrals in what we call the Dark Ages. One of those haunting pieces of nonsense with which Blake's writings abound. He would have been more at home in an inward-turning 13th-century scriptorium than in the life class of an 18th-century academy. His first instinct was to decorate books rather than paint easel pictures. He involved a technique of book decoration in which the background was etched away, the relief lines printed, and the whole then coloured by hand. Although the basis of each copy was the same, the final results differed considerably. They were as much individual creations as medieval miniatures, which were, in fact, nearly all based on earlier pattern books. His first job as a boy had been to make drawings of the monuments in Westminster Abbey for a publisher named Bazaar. He must have spent hours alone in that sacred, overwhelming place. This not only led to his lifelong obsession with recumbent figures, but provided him with types. For example, the ruler or prophet with flowing formalized beard was inspired by an effigy of Edward III. All this could be explained as part of that growing interest in the Middle Ages and its monuments, which since Horace Walpole had provided a kind of fashionable overture to Romanticism. But uh, when one comes on a Blake drawing such as this and compares it with, with an initial from the Winchester Bible, one must allow that the affinity goes far deeper. Blake has retained the formula of mannerist drawing and yet has given his design the rhythmic character of Romanesque. There is no doubt that medieval art had entered deeply into his form creating unconscious. Again and again in studying Blake, one finds how the fashionable mannerist style, the style that he learned from Fuseli, is adapted to the far more purposeful rhythms of the Middle Ages. This influence of medieval illumination coincides precisely with Blake's first illuminated book. And yet, one must admit that in the plates of the songs, the effect is not at all Gothic. It's a far more rococo. Many of the pages remind me of a piece of 18th century needlework. Was this rococo fairyland encircling the page Blake's invention? It certainly meant a lot to him, because he kept it up all through his life. 
I've shown the songs of innocence and experience together because although there is no doubt that between the two, Blake passed through some crisis of disillusionment so that almost every hopeful, trusting poem in the first section is countered by an indignant and embittered poem in the second. Yet, the illuminations are all of a piece. They are in gay colours and filled, for the most part, with sprightly forms. In only one of them, the poison tree, is there any trace of horror or fear? Was this because Blake wanted to maintain the visual unity of the two sections, or was it that at that time embittering experience had only affected a certain level of his mind? Perhaps a bit of both, because the book of Thel, which seems to have been done during these years of disappointment, is also in this gentle lyric vein. The designs connected with it are the most enchanting, not the most powerful, of course, that Blake ever did. They are like the poem itself, a hymn to the female principle of creation. What a tender, spontaneous, happy nature they reveal. Blake, at 35, must have been the most lovable of men. What shall I call thee? I happy am, joy is my name. That word, which meant so much to Coleridge and Wordsworth and all the romantics in their best moments, was embodied at the 33-year-old Blake. And joy continued even in the marriage of heaven and hell. The designs surrounding the text are expressions of flaming energy. Blake enjoys his defiant reversal of orthodox values. In the present conflict of young and old, we know which side Blake would be on. Then, three years later, came America, the horizon, and Europe. And the declaration of those works showed that a change had come over the happy man, far greater than is visible between the songs of innocence and experience. Of course, the change is most painfully evident in the writings. Instead of the deceptive clarity of the lyrics, there is the darkness and confusion of the prophetic books. Instead of childlike song, there is shrieking, wailing, groaning, roaring on almost every page, so that we are deafened as well as confused. It's often said that Blake's disillusion was due to the terror in France that accompanied and succeeded the massacres of sub September 1792. Uh, Blake, like Wordsworth, had been an ardent supporter of the revolution in its early stages. But how much he hoped from it, it's hard to tell. Blake wore a red cap because he was a generous-minded man. But as he later said, he had no business with such matters. It was not the collapse of revolutionary principles that worried Blake, but a growing realization of the cruelty and general beastliness of human beings. In 1793, he engraved the illustrations to Captain Stedman's expedition against the devoted Negroes of Suriname. One can imagine the feelings of this tender-hearted man as he engraved Stedman's drawings of the revolting tortures inflicted on the slaves. It was at this state that he did the first of many depictions of crouching, fettered figures in the depths of despair. And at the same time, he began to draw on memories of Michelangelo's Last Judgment, Tibaldi, and other Italian mannerists, whose images he had kept far back in his mind during the years of confidence. The most notable result of his new state of mind and his new style is the book called Eurizen. For the first time he's concerned with an antibody, with hate rather than love. Eurizen is the embodiment of all that Blake hated. Definition, restriction, measurement, materialism. If there was one combination of words it would have seemed to him to summarize all that was evil. It would have been dialectical materialism. He conceived Eurizen as the prophet of this religion, 
and here he is, Karl Marx drowning in the waters of materialism. In the same vein, and at about the same date, Blake did the series of large monotypes that are the most fully developed of his graphic works. I'll dwell for a minute on two of them because they throw some light on the working of his imagination. They are the Newton and the Nebuchadnezzar. They were probably intended as a pair and they illustrate the terrible results of your horizon's ascendancy. Newton on the higher plane embodying the evil power of the measuring mind, Nebuchadnezzar on the lowest plane, showing material man reduced to a beast. From the early 13th century onwards, compasses have been accepted as a symbol of geometry, and no doubt a medieval image like this was at the back of Blake's mind and inspired him not only with the hand and compasses, but with the look of intense concentration. This was the measuring, law-giving God of Genesis, whom Blake regarded as the evil enemy of mankind. And he'd already had a crack at him in one of his most celebrated plates, the design usually known as the Ancient of Days, although in fact it represents Yorizon the Creator. It is Yorizon triumphant, the complement to your horizon drowning in the waters of materialism. The figure of Nebuchadnezzar is a different story. There could be no reasonable doubt that it derives from a German engraving, probably Cranach's werewolf, which evidently impressed itself on Blake at an early age, and appears in a pencil drawing in the so-called Rossetti manuscript. Blake didn't know what to do with it and after a time included it at the end of the marriage of heaven and hell, apparently illustrating the aphorism, one law for the lion and the ox is oppression. However, uh, this use of the image was so obviously inappropriate that it remained in Blake's mind unallocated, unfulfilled. And then suddenly he recognized what the vision meant. It was Yorizon's most degraded victim, Nebuchadnezzar. And all the horrible associations of the original werewolf are put back and even enhanced by clawed feet. For the student of visionary art, the interesting fact is that an image comes first and takes up residence in the mind long before the artist has any notion why it is there or what it means. Whether visions come from some great reservoir of symbolic images, which are always and eternally there, and if one examines the recurrence of images in history, this proposition is not quite as crazy as it sounds, whether they are due to buried memories, their obsessive power over an artist's mind and their clear compulsive emergence in his work depends on a mental condition that can come and go. When for some reason they no longer present themselves to the mind's eye alive or clamoring to be born, the visionary artist has a hard time. Dark days. And this is particularly true if he has lost the habit of feeding his mind on the observation of nature. Between 1789 and 1794, Blake didn't need to use his eyes. He was inspired. All his greatest works, poems and prints, were done within those five or six years. No wonder that there was a period of reaction when visions no longer came unbidden, and Blake was driven back to squeezing out and reassembling his memories. The eagle of inspiration still hovered above his sleeping form. This and other illustrations to Milton and Jerusalem show that authentic visions still appeared to him. But in the obscure years between 1810 and 1820, there must have been many more evenings of despair. We know that even in his later years, when he did some of his greatest work, he could feel that the doors of enlightenment were closed to him. One of his young admirers, George Richmond, told Blake that he felt deserted by the powers of invention. 
To his astonishment, Blake turned to his wife suddenly and said, It is so with us, is it not? For weeks together, when the visions forsake us. Yet by this time he seems to have been enjoying a wonderful rebirth of visionary powers. A group of young men had discovered him living in poverty and almost total neglect and had treated him like a prophet and sage. Through one of them, Linnell, he was given the commission that was to lead him to his best known work, the engraved illustrations to the Book of Job. Inspiration had returned and entered his left foot like a star. I made the point earlier that Blake's visions are convincing when they represent his own private world of poetry and mythology and not when they illustrate someone else's. The Job is no exception to this rule. Blake had been brooding on the story of Job for almost 40 years. In the course of time he had entirely recreated the allegory in his own terms. In the Bible, Job is the victim of Jehovah. Blake's pet aversion, whom he used to refer to as old Mr. Noble Daddy. And Job's sin is primarily that of disobedience. In Blake's version, the Almighty is the higher nature of Job himself, and thus indistinguishable in his countenance, punishing him for the sins of materialism and complacency. By selection, emphasis, and the inclusion of other biblical texts, he makes the book of Job as expressive of his own philosophy as any of his prophetic books, perhaps rather more so, as it gives him a firmer guiding line and a more economical vocabulary, the only one of his giants who attained form and proportion. The Job engravings achieve a finality and almost classic consistency, exceptional in his art. We're no longer disturbed by the peculiar mannerisms of Blake's drawings. We don't think of Fusilli or Tibaldi. We think, as Blake meant us to think, of the meaning of each episode, which is further enriched by the quotations that surround it. The other masterpiece of Blake's old age, the hundred large watercolours illustrating Dante, is in a way the most inexplicable of all his works. It goes clean contrary to my theory that Blake lost his powers when illustrating another poet. Moreover, Dante's ideas are contrary to everything that Blake believed and had always believed with passionate conviction. If he hated both Aristotle and the hierarchy of heaven, how could he tolerate Dante? If he, if he thought uh, the punishment of sins was evil, how could he illustrate the Inferno? Unanswerable questions. And yet, I think that pictorially, the Dante drawings are the finest things he ever did. Where Blake scholars have remained discreetly silent, only a rash man would offer an explanation. However, I can't resist recording my belief that when, at the age of 60, Blake learnt Italian and read Dante, he felt himself for the first time in the company of a superior being. A sharper imagination, a more powerful intellect. He'd written, I must create my system or be enslaved by another man's. He had created his system and a pretty good model it is. At the end of his life, he had the humility and greatness to draw inspiration from another man's. Those who visited Blake at his old age dwell on his extraordinary serenity as he sat up in bed at work on the Dante drawings. The watercolors themselves have a freedom, a lack of dogmatism that we don't find in the illustrations to his own prophetic books. I don't think it's fanciful to see, in the best of them, a feeling for the rhythms of medieval art. This one has the design of a Gothic window. Even more curious is this watercolour of Dante's Whirlwind of Lovers, one of the finest things Blake ever did. 
where the quasi-mannerist nudes are made into a gigantic Romanesque ornament. The so-called Celtic rhythm is unmistakable. No doubt that Blake was a man of genius, a poet and a prophet. But how good an artist was he? Well, it's partly a matter of scale. We must allow that the men who illustrated the great books of the Middle Ages were artists of the first quality, and Blake could be included among them. He also expressed one very important aspect of the Romantic movement, which would otherwise have been without pictorial expression, the need for a new religion or for a new interpretation of Christianity. Blake was a religious artist, and at the end of the prophetic book, Jerusalem, there is an illustration combining some memory of Indian sculpture with a print of the prodigal son that illustrates these lines. All human forms identified, living, going forth and returning wearied into the planetary lives of years, months, days and hours, reposing and then awakening into his bosom in the life of immortality.